News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Scandal, Murder and the Duke of Cumberland. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at the scandals, attack, suicide and suicide again within the household of the Duke of Cumberland, later to become King of Hanover. Born as the fifth child of King George III, the Duke seems to have been a magnet for scandal. Whether he was assaulting women, attempting to run down people on the road, having an endless array of illicit liaisons and illegitimate children, or expanding on the reasons no reforms should be put into place for the common man. Scandal and dislike seem to follow him in England. His reputation took a decidedly terrible hit with the very odd supposed attack on himself and the strange alleged subsequent suicide of one of his valets. Some twenty years later, another member of his household allegedly committed suicide. We take a look at the scandals and deaths surrounding the Duke of Cumberland. We hope you enjoy the show. About the Duke of Cumberland. Ernest Augustus, the future Duke of Cumberland, born in 1771, was the fifth son of George III, a rather fierce man. He was generally not well favoured by either the public or, it would seem, his own family. Cumberland had fought against the French in 1790 and was said to be a courageous soldier, but quite a strict disciplinarian. Cumberland had been wounded in the war with loss of sight in one eye and a scarred face which did him no favours in terms of his reputation as a blackguard. Cumberland was old school and had been a soldier. He was known for his r ruckus sense of humour that was possibly more appropriate in a soldier's mess, rather than in the presence of women. His many sisters were said to feel uncomfortable being left alone with him. Throughout his life, Cumberland had a reputation as a person of the vilest character. He was involved in a number of scandals. Cumberland was the staunchest of Tory supporters within the House of Lords, and was fiercely opposed to social or political reform, as well as opposing Catholic emancipation. He was known to happily, loudly relay his lack of sympathy for the plight of the common man. Between his unfortunate facial war wounds, his loud and abrasive character, and his lack of sympathy for those less fortunate, Cumberland found himself to be one of the most disliked members of the royal family. The Crime It is the 31st of May, 1810. In the inky depths of the night, betwixt the hours of 2 and 3 a.m., an unknown assailant clandestinely infiltrated the sumptuous confines of the Duke of Cumberland's opulent chamber. Guided by the pallid glow of, of a dark lantern, the intruder adeptly opened a drawer, extracting the Duke's own freshly honed sabre, an ominous artefact destined to play a pivotal role in an extraordinary crime. Clutching the razor-edged blade, the shadowy figure approached the bed allowing the steel to descend in what should have been a lethal trajectory. The initial strike roused the Duke, leaving his skull asunder, the wound so grievous that it laid bare his brain matter. With a resounding cry, the Duke staggered from his bed, each subsequent blow falling relentlessly upon Cumberland's head. Miraculously, the Duke's life was spared by the capricious alignment 
of the blade's flat edge against his skull. Indeed, not only did the Duke endure, but propelled by a surge of adrenaline, the Duke commenced a clamorous uproar. From the Morning Herald, London, the 1st of June, 1810, attempt to assassinate His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland. In our paper of yesterday, we announced exclusively the horrid attempt made on His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland, by one of his confidential valets named Sellis. The Duke had been at the Naval Asylum at Greenwich in the morning and in the evening went to a concert at the Hanover Square Rooms, and, after supping out, did not return to St. James's till near two o'clock yesterday morning. On retiring to his chamber, he dismissed his servant Salisbury, and, as was customary with him, he locked all the doors with his master key and retired to rest. About three o'clock, he was wakened by a violent blow on the head with a cutlass, which was repeated with equal force, on which His Royal Highness jumped out of bed, covered with blood from the wounds, and repeatedly cried out, Murder! Murder! making for the door, during which his villainous assassin gave him two more wounds, one on each arm and two on the side and right thigh. The Duke got the door open, and, as he passed through it, another desperate cut was made at him, which, fortunately, missing His Royal Highness's body, nearly severed the panel in two. The anguished cries of Cumberland beckoned assistance in the form of Cornelius Neal, his dutiful page, who was greeted by a grisly tableau. The Duke's skull, a torrent of blood, and a fearsome weapon lay before him. The room, however, offered no trace of the assailant, save for the battered Duke. Strewn upon the floor was the bloodied sabre, and just beyond it an opal portal through which the malefactor had vanished into the recesses of the palace. Neil grappled with the dilemma of pursuit versus succour, but chose to attend to the ailing duke, now quite unsteady, guiding Cumberland to the refuge of a porter's chamber, and with medical aid summoned, the search of the palace unfolded. The household staff assembled, all save one, Joseph Sellis, a long-serving valet, who, in short order, would ascend to infamy. Although Sellis was absent, his personalised slippers were not. Discovered, concealed in a closet within the Duke's chamber, suspicions arose that this very hiding place had harboured Cumberland's assailant before the nefarious act. With Sellis's enigmatic disappearance, conjectures unfurled. Had he fallen prey to the fleeing culprit or... In a macabre twist, was he the malefactor? As the porter and Mrs. Neal traversed the path to Sellis's quarters, a disconcerting trail unfurled. Every door between the Duke's domain and the absent valet's room stood ajar, as though fashioned into an escape route. Sellis's chamber door, however, ominously remained closed, emitting dreadful sounds of gurgling and spilled liquid. Upon breaching the door, they discovered Joseph Sellis, lifeless, his throat brutally lacerated, yet who wielded the blade? Could such a grievous injury be self-inflicted? From the Morning Herald, London, the 1st of June, 1810, attempt to assassinate His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland. Salisbury, his principal servant, and Sergeant Creighton, with a party of the guards, now rushed up to the Duke's succour, who, almost fainting with a loss of blood, desired them to call up Sellis, on entering whose chamber, to their amazement, 
they found him in his waistcoat without his slippers lying dead on his bed, with his throat cut from ear to ear, his cravat at his feet and a bloody razor open on the table. On their return to the Duke's room, they found the slippers of Celis in a small closet and a pillow at the back of a stool, supposed to be used for his personal ease during his confinement in that narrow space. The ruffian extinguished the night candle on coming forth to perpetrate his bloody deed. Considering these circumstances, no doubt could be entertained of the assassin. Sir John Holm, the Duke's surgeon, was called in with all possible dispatch, and the Prince of Wales, of the moment he heard of the dreadful event, flew to the succour of his royal brother, and, as soon as the wounds were dressed, he set off for Windsor to impart the sad tidings to their majesties and princesses. Some doubt was started whether the act might not have been committed by ruffians who had murdered Celis, but this was soon removed. On examining the floor on which the footsteps of Celis were traced by the Duke's blood to his own bedside, the countenance of the assassin wore scarce a trace of horror upon it, but appeared with the smiling composure which it usually wore. There was one circumstance, however, remains yet unaccounted for. A door into the courtyard, of which Salis always kept the key, being found open and without a key. About Joseph Salis. Salis was originally from Italy. He had worked as a valet in New York to a Mr. Church. Interestingly, Church was burgled for considerable money and goods. Suspicion seems to have settled on Salis, although there was no real evidence. Salis was dismissed, albeit with a generous severance pay. From New York, Salis worked for Lord Mount Edcombe, then moving on to the staff of the Duke of Cumberland in the role of valet. He had worked for Cumberland for some twelve years with no complaint. From the Morning Herald, London, the 1st of June, 1810. Attempt to assassinate His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland. He was a little man and, like most Italians, of a swarthy complexion. He has left four children and a widow who, before she married him, was a milliner on Duke Street, St. James's. He had apartments for his wife and family in the palace and adjoining to the residence of his royal master. He was highly favoured by his royal highness. About five months ago, Mrs. Sellis was delivered of a son, for whom his royal highness stood sponsor, and one of the princesses. We believe Princess Augusta condescended at his request to become grandmother by proxy. It was not on Wednesday night the turn of Celis to be in waiting, for it was the practice of the pages to attend alternately. It was therefore remarkable that when out of waiting he should have remained in the house of his royal highness, on, as on such occasions he always used to go to the apartments which had been provided for his wife and family. Cumberland had sustained seven wounds. From the Morning Herald, London, the 1st of June, 1810. Attempt to assassinate His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland. Two separate gashes on the head, one in the neck, one across each arm, one on the right thigh and one on the side. The Duke always wears a broad, roughed bandeau over his nightcap, to which he owes the preservation of his life as his head, but for this fortunate intervention which was cut through would no doubt have been severed. The wounds in themselves are declared not to be dangerous unless they become so from consequent fever. 
the shocking story of England's least favourite royal gripped the papers and the public. What could have been the motive for such an onslaught? None could be determined. It was said that he was a trusted and favoured servant in Cumberland's household. An inquest was held the following day, and, as expected, stories poured forth regarding Sellers's temperament in order to explain the attack and his alleged subsequent suicide. The Inquest Upon his return to Britain, Sellers prospered, joining Lord Mount Edcombe's staff before catching the eye of the Duke of Cumberland. However, at the inquest, Sellers's shadowed past emerged, an outspoken advocate for American independence, sharply critical of King George III, and incongruous traits for one on the royal payroll. The inquiry and public sentiment converged on Sellis as the assailant in the St. James's Palace events, akin to his presumed role in the New York affair. Witnesses divulged peculiar tales involving the deceased valet. Concealed pokers and pistols in the staff quarters and assertions of a, a tempestuous temperament. Sarah Varley, a housemaid, disclosed discovering a pistol behind Sellers's bed, countered by Neil, who claimed ownership. Neil Entangled in an ongoing feud with Sellis, conjectured that the valet intended to murder Cumberland, framing Neil in a convoluted vendetta. Sellis's thwarted scheme, Neil hypothesised, led to a self-inflicted demise. The jury, upon visiting the palace, beheld blood-spattered walls footprints imprinted on the bloody sabre, and the gruesome spectacle of Celis's lifeless form, his throat gashed, a wound so profound it halted only at his spine. The inquiry's conclusion posited that Celis, having assaulted the duke, abandoned his weapon, fleeing only to return to his chamber to slit his own throat. With the inquest concluding that Sellis was indeed the murderer in what seemed a rather rushed manner, the hope by Cumberland was that it would all blow over. But it did not. Numerous questions regarding the attack and the alleged subsequent suicide of Sellis remained. The sink filled with bloody water in Sellis's apartment, the gash on Sellis himself. How could anyone cut their throat so deeply? The belief that the crime scene had been rearranged. Sellers's motive that was put forward remained unconvincing for many. The populace, captivated by the macabre narrative, flocked to the palace, gaining restricted access to view the crime scene and Celis's quarters. Despite a clandestine burial, Celis left behind mourning kin, an enigmatic figure whose life and death became an indelible mark on the annals of St. James's Palace. The pronouncement echoed through the hallowed chambers. The jury, in solemn deliberation, rendered their verdict a damning decree that Joseph Sellis had assailed the Duke before consummating his own demise. Yet, in the wake of this grave judgment, Sellis's widow, Mary Anne, recoiled from its acceptance. A steadfast defender of her husband's character, she steadfastly asserted his buoyant spirits, anticipating an imminent journey with Cumberland to Windsor. In her heart, she harboured an unyielding conviction that he, in no conceivable manner, could be a murderer. 
The shroud of doubt cast upon Cornelius Neal did not escape Mary Anne's scrutiny. A year prior, her departed spouse had, in written reproach, accused Neil of pecuniary misdeeds. Could this not serve as motive to dispatch Celis and fabricate a sinister tableau? Mary Ann, Celis's widow, was not alone in her suspicions regarding the incident. Whispers of scandal sought even greater depth, weaving a narrative of a salacious triangle. An insinuation emerged that Celis and Cumberland were more than master and servant until the advent of Neil, who purportedly supplanted Celis in the Duke's affections. Did the knight in question witness Celis discovering the two in an illicit embrace, prompting a frenzied assault that compelled Cumberland to orchestrate Celis's demise to stifle the damning truth? With rumours flying now in print that the Duke of Cumberland had been in a lover's tryst with his valet, Neil, and that pair had been caught in the act by Celis, thereby necessitating Celis's murder, the Duke took the publisher to court. From the Morning Chronicle, the 19th of April, 1832, Court of King's Bench. This libel was contained in a publication entitled Authentic Records of the Court of England for the Last Seventy Years. That libelous matter commenced at page 93 of the book and extended to page 106 of the same publication, forming in the whole about 12 or 13 pages of libel. The subject matter of this most atrocious and infamous libel was a charge against the Duke of Cumberland of having committed or having intended or attempted to commit a detestable crime or some other indecent and unnatural crime or of having been guilty of some practice of an indecent nature, having some reference to the crime, this was the nature of of the first part of the libel. The second part of this libelous matter was of this nature and description. It was represented that the illustrious person on whose behalf he made the present application had been detected in the commission of the crime or in a situation indicating an intention or design to commit the crime, or some rather other unnatural or indecent offence by a person of the name of Celis, and it was further represented or insinuated that His Royal Highness afterwards, in order to prevent the disclosure of the circumstance by Celis, either himself murdered Celis, or caused or provoked him to be murdered, or was in some way an accessory and privy to his murder for the said purpose of getting rid of his evidence and preventing his being a witness against him. The publication went on to say, on the morning of the 1st of June, an astounding communication was made by the daily papers that His Royal Highness had been surprised in the night and that his life had been attempted by one of his valets named Celis. Many reports were circulated, and the general opinion was that the Duke was the murderer. Of course, the High Tory party took no small pains to propagate the opposite sentiment, but the former was most generally believed from the analogy of attending circumstances. The publication went on to question the inquest that had been hastily put together by a close friend of the Duke and listed the issues with the crime and the judgment against Celis. Also, the first jury chosen had been dismissed as they had refused to return a verdict and replaced by a second jury, all members being hand-picked 
by Cumberland's friend, Lord Ellenborough. It summed up its reasons for lacking confidence in the inquest with six reasons. The very unusual request for additional arms in the bedroom of a prince without some reason given. The absence of Neil during the whole of the examination of the Duke's wounds, yet he gave the alarm. The situation of the body of Celis rendering it utterly impossible that he had fallen by his own hand. The omission of the principal witness, the attendant, on the jury. The strange difference between the announced and the actual state of the Duke's health. The refusal of a verdict by the first jury and the very ready compliance and concurrence of the second. We certainly feel sure that there was much mystery in the affair, and we ought to inquire from whence that mystery originated. Had it been the case of a poor man, he must have been hanged and his body given for dissection, merely upon circumstantial evidence. But the son of a reigning monarch has, by circumstantial evidence, only been acquitted. Cumberland and those named in the article all gave testimony supporting the original finding of the inquest purporting Sellers as having attacked Cumberland from momentary insanity. The Duke won his libel case. However, the severe damage to his reputation remained with a lingering feeling that he had gotten away with murder. He was known to be booed and hissed in public, the royal family quietly distanced themselves from him. The Duke, who had made a marriage that was unpopular with Queen Charlotte, another of Cumberland's many scandals, spent much of his time living in Germany, thereby avoiding the continued speculation regarding his affairs as well as living cheaper. In 1829, Cumberland returned to live in England, and the rumours and scandals surrounding him started anew. These included speculation as to his illicit affairs, attacks on other members of the aristocracy, including women, attempting to run down women who were in his way on the road, and children that he had fathered out of wedlock. In 1833, a fresh new scandal was introduced with the alleged suicide of another of the Duke's staff, Henry Hamptfeld, the head butler, who had been in service to Cumberland for over twenty years. This unfortunate incident reignited all the old scandal and rumour that had never truly gone away with Celis. From the Belfast Newsletter, the 1st of October, 1833, Suicide of the Duke of Cumberland's butler. On Tuesday, a coroner's jury was impanelled at Mortlake to inquire into the circumstances connected with the suicide of Henry Hampfeld, aged 45, head butler to the Duke of Cumberland, who had been in the service of His Royal Highness nearly 20 years. His Royal Highness and other gentlemen of distinction were present at the investigation. It appeared from the evidence that the body was taken out of the Thames near Hugh Bridge on Sunday afternoon. On Saturday afternoon he was seen at his desk in the pantry in Kew Palace, engaged in writing letters, and was observed for the last time at about half past ten o'clock. Since he had known he was going to Germany with His Royal Highness, he had been low-spirited and was heard to say he would rather be in London than in Germany. Previous to that, he was in the habit of getting intoxicated, and on one occasion deceased Mr. Hampfield and the steward, Ball, had a quarrel in consequence of Mr. Hampfield leaving the plate, the silver, unprotected when he was overpowered by liquor for which he rebuked him. 
There was no imputation on his character except his propensity to drink. He had never been heard to say that he was dissatisfied with his situation. On the contrary, he had said his Royal Highness was a good master and would provide for him. One of the witnesses stated that on the Saturday, Hampfeld was in a very despondent state of mind, in consequence of the under-butler having received orders to accompany the plate to London for the purpose of being packed up. Hampfeld thought they had lost confidence in him and said it almost broke his heart. In connection with this, His Royal Highness stated that in sending the under-butler to London with the plate, no slight was intended to the deceased. Cumberland told the steward he had better send the other man, as he should want the Hampfell to wait at table on Sunday. But it was evident Hampfell laboured under a false impression. On Sunday morning a letter was found in the deceased room addressed to the head page Franzilius, in which was enclosed the key of his writing desk. The letter was produced and interpreted by the Reverend R. Jelk, preceptor to Prince George. From the style it evidently showed that he was in a disturbed state of mind at the time. It was as follows. Dear Franzilius, I beg you to announce to the world how far the tyrant has carried matters with me, after serving twenty years and really like a slave. May all good men be happy. God bless the good Prince George, so that he may soon recover his sight. I curse Cumberland and the old ball, meaning the steward. Herewith I renounce the splendour of the world, for my soul is pure and blessed. Another letter was found that was directed to his father. My dear father, curse not thy son, who renounces the world in consequence of a slight. My master, the tyrant whom the world hates, has terminated my life. Twenty years I have served him faithfully and honestly, and in truth have been his slave. Embrace my brothers and sisters, and bless my soul, which is certainly better than my reputation. Your son, now no more, Henry. The jury expressed themselves perfectly satisfied, and after a short deliberation, returned a verdict that the deceased drowned himself, being at the time in a state of temporary derangement. The inquest lasted seven hours. Another inquest into a questionable suicide of a member of the Cumberland household, again with the finding of temporary derangement. History continues to question the deaths in his household, and questions persist whether Cumberland was involved in either or both death. In 1837, upon the death of King William IV, Queen Victoria became Queen of England, and Ernest, the Duke of Cumberland, became King of Hanover. Apparently, within Hanover, Cumberland was a popular ruler, not least for being one of the few of Hanover's monarchs to actually live there. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, Scandal, Murder and the Duke of Cumberland. We very much hope that you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. 
the News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.